failure is, in a sense, the highway to success, inasmuch as every discovery of what is false leads us to see seek earnestly for what is true. Welcome to the Recreation and Outdoor Education Leadership Speaker Series. I'm Brooke Moran, Professor of Recreation and Outdoor Education, what we call ROW, uh, and also the Director of this series. Uh, we've had some really wonderful speakers this semester, um, and the lineup for the spring is looking to be fantastic, inspiring, eye-opening, etc. So, you can tell that I'm not an art major. If you want information to check out the archives or want to see what's going to be happening in the spring, that information will be up soon. So just western.edu forward slash LSS for Leadership Speaker Series. I should probably have like on the string. Anyway. Um, to bring folks to campus, we collaborate around campus. Um, Everyone pitches in a little bit, a little bit of energy, a little bit of money, a little bit of ideas. So I wanted to thank this round for bringing in Tyler, the School of Business, Exercise and Sports Science, Sociology, Honors, the Convocation Fund, and of course, Roe. Yeah. <laughs> um, we started this series for kind of two main reasons. The one being pretty darn obvious, that we want our students and our Western community and the greater Gunnison Valley to learn about different aspects of leadership through the eyes and experiences of diverse leaders and folks around the country and, and probably eventually around the world. The second one is a little less obvious, and that is, um, as some of you may have already thought tonight, a lot of people don't really know what recreation and outdoor education is or if it should be a major or if it's too elementary or maybe it's just elusive. So we wanted to use this opportunity to help teach folks what it is we do. And so I have three kind students who are gonna help out tonight and give a little blurb about their experiences and their insights from working in the industry and going through our program. So first we have Erin Kearns, who is a junior and she's double majoring in outdoor leadership and environment and sustainability. Uh, thanks, Brooke. Um, so back in high school, I was straight A student, did every sport, every club, blah, 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 and when I graduated, I did exactly what I was supposed to do and went to this preppy East Coast school. Uh, worst decision of my life. So I packed up my stuff, drove 2,500 miles to a school that I've never visited in a state that I've never been to to start a major that I've never even heard of. And so here I am at Western living what I would call a civilized dirtbag lifestyle, where I write papers in tents and on the dashboards of cars on the way to crags and mountains. And I like to lead by example in the fact that, yes, I am a skier who wants to live out of my car and, and eat beans and rice and ski fat power lines every day. But at the same time, I have a responsibility to be an educated citizen and help others to do the same. And the rec program has helped me to do exactly that. In a recreational business class with Brooke Moran that I'm taking right now, I've had the opportunity to design a business model for a guiding company that I work for back in Vermont, where I have designed a guided ski touring program for them to implement with the business model, the financial aspects, and the advertising campaigns that I've developed through this class. And I've also had the opportunity recently to work with a program called She Jumps out of Jackson Hole, uh, which started with skiers like Lindsay Dyer and Pip Hunt to help get more girls out into the mountains. And I'm bringing that program here to Western to help bring events like All Girls Ski Days at CBMR and backcountry educational trips through our Wilderness Pursuits program to help Western girls help each other get out and get into the mountains in a positive environment that is 
hard to find in mountain towns for girls. And through these experiences, I've realized that creating a career out of your passions is 100% viable and that being in the outdoor industry, you don't have to just be a bum. It's for anyone that wants to get out there and connect with each other and connect with the natural environment that is so important to us. And also that through this program, I have developed the skills I need to go into absolutely any field that I want to, not just the rec program. But most importantly, I'm building a lifestyle that steps outside the boxes that society tries to throw us into. And I have the tools to help inspire and show other people that they can follow their real dreams as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freericks. 
my name is Eddie Ogle. I'm an ROE major. I'm graduating in five weeks, and I am scared shitless. <laughs> Although I shouldn't be, mainly because of how the ROE major has prepared me. Every semester, I've been encouraged to work with different populations within the community, and through that, I have excellent experiences and strong interpersonal skills to build off of. As an environmental education emphasis, I've had the opportunity to complete an awesome internship this past summer, creating and designing an environmental stewardship summer camp. Now, I'm completing an internship with Partners, also known as Gunnison Valley Mentors, running their after-school program for elementary school kids. Through my classes, internships, and my personal drive for adventure, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the recreation major and industry as a whole. After all, it's an expressive and experiential outlet in society. Some of my favorite memories come from adventure and those who I adventure with, like my fellow ROE majors. These boys. <laughs> if you get a group of us ROE majors together, there's two things that you can count on. One, we probably won't shut up. We like to talk. And two, we're gonna have a good time. So, another aspect of this major that I really like is the professors and their willingness to help you out, whether it be in classwork or just life advice in general. By the time you end this ROE major, you've pretty much built a network of professionals within the recreational industry. When recently talking to a professor, Brooke, shout out, <laughs> about uh, my future life plans, she kind of reassured me that maybe I'm not scared shitless, but I'm just excited for what's to come. So, for all of you who may be weary of the ROE major, I just must inform you that we are more than camping majors. <laughs> we develop leadership, facilitation, and risk management skills, along with strong environmental ethics. And yes, just like Carter, I can build a damn good campfire. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, you three. So hopefully you got a little bit more of an inkling and uh, we do stand in circles a lot. Uh, and uh, we do have a lot of fun. Um, but there is more to it than that, so thanks, y'all. So, a lot of you know Tyler, perhaps from his book, from his 60 Minutes interview, maybe from the Wolf Blitzer clip, or you have heard of him on Oprah, or apparently there's some new show going around the last couple weeks someone's, someone's talking about, rehashing all the events. Um, so tonight he's going to talk about his experiences in the pro cycling doping scandal. So I'm really not going to touch on that and his sort of traditional resume in my introduction. Tyler is ranked number one in the world for cycling. Some of you may be saying, well, yeah, but he was doping. Well, so were all the other top riders. So all things equal. That's a pretty astounding accomplishment. But this is really just only one in a string of accomplishments based on intense focus, determination, and grueling training. Tyler and I went to high school together in New Hampshire. 250 students, we all knew each other. So I knew that he was a really accomplished alpine skier, one of the best in the East. Ben Eaton, who's in the audience here, we also went to school together, one of Tyler's classmates. I said, hey, like, what do you remember about Tyler? What, you know? And he said, Tyler made intensely hard work really fun. All right, he's very motivating. So we had a pretty intense school schedule. Uh, sports were required all three seasons. 
Uh, Monday through Saturday, we had sports. We'd have day classes on Wednesday and Saturday and then went to games or sports or races, that sort of thing. So Sundays were this really kind of sacred time where, well, maybe, maybe not sacred for homework. It was kind of when you had to do homework, but it might be sleeping time or socializing time or eating ice cream and pizza or, you know, so on. In the spring, Tyler's sport was cycling. And I remember one Sunday in April, again, this is a really small school, the news had spread that Tyler and a teammate had ridden a century, a hundred miles on the weekend. As a high schooler, this was just sort of unknown. This is crazy, but this is Tyler. He went on to ski race for CU Boulder, and after breaking two vertebra, while cross-training with a ski team, oddly enough, on a bike. Uh, <laughs> he got out of bed and the doctor said, really the only thing you can do is cycle. So he dove into cycling. He was so focused that he was a national collegiate champion, drug-free, after one and a half years, recruited by a pro team, drug-free, within two years, and riding in his first of eight Tours de France in three years. At our high school, all the juniors did this thing called Outback. It's like a mini Outward Bound. So it was 10 days in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and we had a three-day solo during that time. And we were given a number 10 billy can, uh, I think a piece of fruit maybe, a little chocolate bar, a little thing of peanut butter, I think a box of raisins that inevitably froze and you couldn't really chew them and when you did they got stuck. And, and we got a blank sheet of paper where we could write ourselves a letter that we'd get in the year. So Tyler and I were comparing, uh, <laughs> comparing stories yesterday. And uh, stories about solo. And I felt pretty darn confident going into solo. Like, I'm a New Hampshire girl, out in the sticks for fun. I'd go hiking, I'd go out with my pony and do, you know, do whatever. So I was like, I totally got this solo thing down. And um, so I go out on solo, you have a little space, and I dug, took my billy can or my snowshoe or whatever it was, and dug a big fire pit, like, you know, kind of four by four, four depth. And I got to the bottom and there's a huge puddle of standing water. As a tip, just not the best thing for building a fire. Realized that I had sort of dug my spot in a hollow, and I was so frustrated, I was like, all right, fine, I'm just gonna take a break, I'm gonna go collect some firewood. Again, you have to girl, I know how to collect firewood, so I see this standing dead aspen, because the snow's too deep to see anything on the ground, and I go up to it, and I was like, just feeling burly. So I walk up to it and wrap my hands around it and yank, no. <laughs> Some of you are the students are asking right now, oh my God, why did I pay money to learn from this woman? <laughs> I did survive, I learned a few things along the way. So, we're laughing and I was like, Tyler, what'd you do? He's like, oh, it was so cool. I built this cabin. I was like, what? <laughs> Like, I built a cabin. I was like, you mean like a couple sticks against a tree? He's like, no, like a four-sided cabin. It was awesome. I, all day I was collecting all these, all this wood and like farming it. And I was like, of course you built a cabin. <laughs> Beautiful top on it, pine boughs for insulation and comfort and this you know, I just imagine him this like beautiful crackling fire writing his notes while I'm like shivering <laughs> with no fire. So Tyler goes all in, no matter what he does. The same goes for exposing himself in all aspects of pro cycling and ubiquitous doping practices. He's received death threats. He's been bullied, shunned, shamed. Oh, and by the way, by the same folks who were also doping. Tailed by private investigators, yet he perseveres in pursuit of rectifying the sport, to free himself from the lies, and to hopefully allow us to learn from his experiences. Because these lessons span far beyond cycling. In my eyes, he has a lot of courage. We all make mistakes, perhaps have regrets, 
maybe are ashamed at times. But leaders are the ones who don't shy from those experiences, who own them, learn from them, and grow out of them. And Tyler is an example of one such leader. So please help me invite Tyler to the stage. for probably about 20 minutes, maybe a little less, um, and then I want to open up to question and answer. There's no question that you can't ask in an open book now, so please, if you can think of anything, ask it. Uh, if you're not sure, just ask it anyways. So, okay? Promise? <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I had some, I had eight slides for you, but um, I'm kind of computer, uh, I'm not such a good technician on a computer, so we're going to have to go without. The Tour de France, it's arguably the world's most difficult athletic event. It's 21 days of racing, over 2,500 miles, on some of the world's most punishing roads. It's like running a marathon every day for three weeks. I raced the Tour eight times and put every ounce of energy into that race. Getting to that final finish line in Paris was a feat in itself. But during those years, finish lines were not the only lines being crossed. Cycling had a dark side, a side I wasn't ready for, and one that pushed me over a line that I never thought, I never thought I'd cross. Once on the other side, there was no going back. It was the beginning of a double life filled with secrets and lies that would destroy me from the inside long after I left the sport. Johnny Cash once said, lies have to be covered up, but truths can run around naked. This is my story about lies and the truth, and what happens when you compromise your values to chase a dream, and how one bad decision can snowball into so many more. It's also about realizing, realizing that no matter how bad things get or how impossible the situation seems, there is always a way out. When I started racing, I realized I had a special ability to endure pain. It might sound strange, but pain is something I've always been good at. It comes from my family. My dad would tell me when I was younger that it's not the size of the dog in a fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Another Hamilton trait was honesty. My parents didn't put many demands on us, but the one thing they wouldn't tolerate or put up with was lying. Tell the truth or else, no matter what. Tough and honest, with those two traits, I thought I could handle just about anything. When it came to racing, I always knew I could outwork anyone and that I could win at the highest level on grit and a willingness to suffer alone. When I arrived at the top level of cycling, I did what I knew best. I worked my tail off and I never gave up. During that time, there was a word I kept hearing the Europeans say, Paniagua. Hmm. They'd say that guy's doing well even though he's Paniagua, or he'll never finish today, he's Paniagua. Eventually I found out what they were saying in Spanish, pan y agua, bread and water. Trans, um, in other words, racing clean without performance enhancing drugs. During that same time, I noticed that the top guy, or the guys on our team, the US Postal Service team, getting little white lunch bags from the team doctors after every race. 
I didn't know what was in them, but I knew I wasn't getting one. And then I figured out what was going on. And that became my motivation to work even harder, to prove I didn't need one. But things were about to change. One night after a tough week-long race in Spain, there I was in my hotel room, completely exhausted, physically depleted. The team doctors knew I was hurting, and one of them, Pedro Salaya, came in and checked on me. He was, um, he was concerned and sympathetic, almost fatherly. He told me how hard I had worked, how much I had pushed through the pain, and how he admired that. He said, I have to start taking care of my body, make myself healthier. Pedro always wore this fly fishing vest. And I watched him reach into the left upper pocket and pull out a little red egg-shaped capsule. He said, Tyler, this is for your health. It's not over. It's for your health. He handed me the capsule, and there I was, at the crossroads, in or out. Yes or no. I swallowed the red egg without much thought. <clears throat> and it was testosterone, a banned substance. Of course, I knew it was against the rules. But I had worked so hard and was so close to my dream of riding in the Tour de France that I felt I owed it to myself to look the other way. I justified it. I told myself everybody was doing it and it was a necessary part of competing at the top level. But I knew it was wrong, and deep down, I was ashamed. But that shame is buried by a new feeling of possibility. How far can I go? How fast can I ride? How good can I be? In a strange way, in a strange way, it was a badge of honor. It meant the team finally thought I was good enough to get a white lunch bag. Now on the inner circle, I was next led to injections of a drug called EPO, or Edgar Allan Poe, as we called it. EPO increases the production of red blood cells, which carry oxygen to the muscles and improve endurance. With EPO, we can train harder and longer. And in a three-week race like the Tour de France, EPO was an absolute game changer. At the time, EPO was undetectable, and it was fast and easy. A quick swab of the arm, a little injection, and done. Like the red egg, it didn't, didn't feel like a big deal. In the beginning, EPO and all the other drugs were given, paid for, transported, and administered by the team. Because it was done, done for all for us, we reasoned it was the team breaking the rules, and we, the riders, were just the dutiful employees. That situation changed up in the 1998 Tour de France when police raided the, a vehicle of a French team and uncovered a massive amount of dopamine. From that point on, it became too risky for the team to manage our doping program. We would now have to do it all ourselves. Team management told us the new system was for safety. But now, the risk of transporting and border crossing was all on us. Since there would be no EPO on the team cars anymore, how would we get it during the tour? Our team leader, Lance Armstrong, came up with a plan. His gardener, Philippe, or Motorman as we nicknamed him, would zip through the Tour de France circus on his motorcycle and drop off the drugs to an undercover staff member. The staff member would have our syringes waiting for us, sometimes tucked in our sneakers or in our race bags. We would inject quickly, 30 seconds at the most, throw the syringes into an empty Coke can, crush the can to make them look like trash, the team doctor would bury him in the, in, in the bottom of his backpack, open the door, walk past crowds of fans, journalists, and police. There we were in the middle of one of the world's biggest sporting events, injecting banned drugs just feet from thousands of people. People always want to know why we didn't get caught. Weren't there drug tests? Of course there were, and plenty of them. But if you follow the doctor's instructions or cheat sheets, none of them were hard to beat. I passed hundreds of tests when I shouldn't have. And in the 1990s, there was no test for EPO at all. In 2000, that changed. The team was warned by an inside source that an EPO test 
could be used at the upcoming tour. We needed a new strategy to work around the EPO test. The team decided to try a safer alternative. A couple weeks before the tour, I boarded a private jet with Lance and another teammate and flew to Valencia. Below us, we could see the French Riviera, the mansions and the yachts. It felt like a fantasy world. When we landed in Valencia, the team doctors and staff members were there in the tarmac waiting for us. As we drove to the secluded hotel, the doctors told us how easy this new method would be, how safe it was, and how there was absolutely nothing to worry about. What they were talking about was blood transfusions, or blood doping. I'd heard about transfusions before, but I couldn't believe athletes actually did them. Doctors will extract your blood, store it in a fridge or freezer, and then reinfuse it back into your body when it is depleted. It has the same red blood cell boosting effect that EPO has, only this was natural. But in reality, it was a risky, dangerous procedure with serious consequences if done improperly. Blood transfusions, blood transfusions are not the same as swallowing a pill or getting an injection. Here you're watching a big, clear bag fill up with your own warm red blood. You never forget it, and you never get used to it. And when you're leaving in the hands of doctors with questionable pasts, things can go wrong. After one visit, I left the doctor's office in a hurry to catch a flight. Hailing a cab with one arm, I felt a strange wetness on the other. I looked down and saw my hand dripping with blood, my sleeve completely soaked in red. It looked as though I'd been stabbed. The hole from the extraction needle had me closed. That point in time characterized exactly what my life had become. There I was on a street corner in Madrid, hiding behind dark sunglasses and a baseball cap, paranoid of being seen. In one hand, I'm holding a cell phone filled with code names and numbers, while the other hand is covered in blood. And down the street in a back room clinic, a doctor I don't trust is stockpiling bags of my blood, all for a bike race. People ask me, why wasn't that enough to make me stop it all right then and there? My reality was so twisted by then, I reasoned it was just temporary. My career would be over in a couple of years, and once it was done, I'd be back to living a normal life. So there I was, at the top of the pack, cruising up and over the French Alps and Pyrenees, the Italian Dolomites, and the Belgian Ardennes winning at the highest level in the most famous bike races in the world. <clears throat> I was now the elite of the elite. I fulfilled my childhood dream of becoming an Olympic champion. Excuse me. <laughs> my, my childhood dream of becoming an Olympic champion. I truly made it. I was living the American dream. My family was so proud. Invitations came rolling in, ring the opening bell on Wall Street, throw the first pitch at a Red Sox game, nationally televised interviews. These wins, these highs, these accomplishments should have made me feel like, on top, like I was on top of the world. Yet my life was spinning out of control and I worried more about getting caught than I did about winning. But what could I do? I already walked into the casino and rolled the dice. I was in way over my head. There was no turning around and no way out. And then it all came to a screeching halt. It was the second week of the 2004 Tour of Spain. I was at the peak of my cycling career, and I got the news. I failed the drug test. Another person's cells, blood cells, were detected in my blood. I assumed that the blood bags had been mixed. It was a mistake that could have killed me. There was my moment my opportunity to finally do the right thing, tell the truth, take responsibility, and leave this all behind, and start my life over again. Instead, with the pressure mounting, I lied. <coughs> Professional cycling was a brotherhood. We lived by the Emerita, a code of silence we all understood. 
We protected each other, we protected the system. Lying and, and denying is what I was supposed to do. You get caught, you say nothing, you take one for the team. That's how it was done. If I told the truth, I would have to implicate everyone involved. Dozens of people, many of my friends, would lose their jobs, and I'd be blackballed from the sport forever. I received a two-year suspension. For 14 years, I lied to everyone. During that time, I had two faces. The person they thought I was, and the person I knew I was. A doper and a liar, who was unraveling on the inside. I dealt with depression, alcohol abuse, suicidal thoughts, and feelings of self-hate that never went away. I was alone and a prisoner of my own decisions. I retired in 2009. Six years after I wrote my last Tour de France, a subpoena arrived at my front door. There was a federal investigation underway into Lance Armstrong and the U.S. Postal Service cycling team. I was ordered to testify before a grand jury. The choice in front of me was stark. Tell the truth or go to jail. When I walked in that courtroom, I knew what I had to do. From the very first question, the truth came pouring out. And for the next seven hours, I unloaded more than a decade of lies. The more I talked, the more I realized I had spent the last 14 years protecting a culture that was never worth protecting. I was breaking the omerta and the unwritten rule of the Brotherhood, giving testimony that would destroy careers, hopes, dreams, and lives. But in that moment, I was free. Would I, would I have come clean at my back not been against the wall? If nothing had changed and I still believed I had a responsibility to protect the sport, the answer is probably not. Being forced to testify gave me clarity and the courage to take back my life. For 14 years, I believed the truth would ruin me. In the end, the truth saved me. While my story happened in cycling, every industry has its unwritten rules, its own secret race. Corporate corruption is widespread. Academic cheating is at an all-time high and a growing number of people in the workplace feel they have to bend the rules to get ahead. Whether the rewards are money, fame, power, personal validation, a promotion, or a scholarship, the pressure to excel is taking its toll. Every day we're presented with red eggs, moments when the lure of success or fear of failure puts us to the test. Should you fudge that number just this once to meet your sales quota? Do you turn a blind eye when your boss overcharges a customer? Do you inflate your re resume to get that dream job? I wish I had been better prepared for that day Pedro walked into my hotel room. I wish I had thought harder about swallowing that first red egg, about where it would lead and how out of control things would get. I wish I had known how numb victories would seem when they were achieved dishonestly. And I wish I knew then that giving back an Olympic gold medal would feel better than winning it. So, thank you guys. Western, I got that question a few times. Um, 
let's see, sometimes from the needles I, I would get the sm small little infections. Um, I had several botched blood bag attempts, you know, one, the, one being the positive test that I had, you know, I assumed that that was a mixed blood bag. Um, one, another time I, I received a, a transfusion in the blood bag had not been stored properly. And so I, they reinfused a bag of dead red blood cells. Um, I got a major fever. Um, huge headache. This is in, in the middle of the 2004 tour de France. Yeah, I, could have basically, I basically could have died. I was very lucky to live. Even, but you know, I continued in the race. I just kind of buried it and moved on. Um, uh, yeah, we took I don't know, you know. So far, so good, but like my life could definitely be compromised. I'm 43 years old now, but I appreciate every day now, that's for sure. Good question. Do you, uh, oh, cool. How's it going? My bad. Uh, <laughs> what is your relationship like with Lance Armstrong now, and yeah. um, what are some of the tips that the doctor gave you to get you past the drug test? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Set to the next question. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, my, my relationship with Lance Armstrong now doesn't doesn't exist. And yeah, we've had our history. The last time I saw him was uh, when the federal investigation was going on. I was at a charity event in Aspen, just from over the hill, I guess. And um, I was at a restaurant having dinner with some friends. He approached me. Um, I was sorry. I was at dinner with some friends eating, and I got up to use the restroom on the way back. Uh, I had to walk through this dimly lit bar area and out of nowhere comes the hand of Lance. And, uh, he was pissed off. And, uh, I'll just leave it at that. But that's the last time I really saw him. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, what was the second part of your question? I apologize. What are some of the tips that the uh, Oh, some of the tips that, uh, yeah, that, so our the team doctors had you know, they give you basically a cheat, cheat sheet and they tell you, you know, what product to do, take and when, um, and they would spell everything out. And, you know, every year the, the drug testing was changing, so every year the, you know, the cheat sheets changed. But, um, you know, for example, with EPO, it's just taken in, in the 90s, well, in the 90s there was no EPO test, so it was a free for all, it was a wild west. Um, the only thing they had was a 15% one, so a lot of guys pushed that in. Basically, your hematocrit um, could be no higher than 50. Uh, but once they did get the EPO test, and um, the first time they used it was in the Sydney Olympics in the year 2000, and uh, they, the doctors quickly learned about the test and figured out that you could go, instead of doing it under the skin, you do it right into the vein, a little bit less amount. You could do it more frequently, but um, less, smaller amounts, and it would go through your body quicker. You, you test negative. Um, yeah, they give you in eight, eight hours time to be out of your system. So, yeah. Um, there are other tips. Yeah, testosterone is another thing. That, that you have to be careful with. Um, let's see. You know, we, there were certain things, certain drugs that were uh, allowed uh, if the doctor, if you had a, a medical reason. So, and these were called TUEs, therapeutic use exemptions. And certain things like cortisone, which was fully illegal, but if you had a, a bad knee or something, you could take it. So every Tour de France, they, they would fill you up with cortisone. Um, pretty, I'm a, well, they, they are so, um, yeah. Um, good question. Uh, and blind open is still today, to this day, there's still no test for it. <laughs> I was just wondering how extensive the use of EPO was in the races. I know Lance, in his Oprah interview, tried to deny a lot of it and kind of pushed a bunch of it under the rug, but it seemed like to accomplish the piece that he did, it would have been the extensive. Is that me? Sorry. Um, uh, in 1997, that was 
my first when I did my first tour, I, I would guess out of the there was a, a I believe it's 208 starters. I would be I would be surprised if five didn't t did not take a year. That was you know in the dark days and in the wild western days. Um, you know I think that changed over the years, but um, back then it was everybody was doing it. And it was yeah. We just we all we all told ourselves it wasn't cheating because we were all doing it basically. But it was totally wrong. It was twisted, super twisted. Good question. Yes. Um, do you write like, offline for? Or is it like, I do some. I, I have a coaching company. We I write some. I write customized training programs for kind of weekend warrior type athletes. Um, I don't. I've taken a break from cycling. Um, I, you know, I do it once. I'll ride once in a while for a charity event. It's for a great cause. I can't. I can't say no. I ride downtown to get coffee. <laughs> That's pretty much you know, you know stuff. Issues. I've taken a break from it. Um, I'm sure I'll come back to it someday, but it's been, I think, a healthy, necessary break. Um, that's a good question, though. Good question. Um, but I, I like to, I mean, my new sport's paddleboard. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. How are you affected financially now that you hear about her? How am I? Um, yeah, finance, I'm not, yeah, I've, I've lost everything. But it feels great. No, but really, it does. It does. Um, yeah, so I, I'm start, I live in Missoula, Montana now. I lived there about two and a half years ago. Fresh start, new, new life. You know, I, I spent the last last six months in Missoula finishing that book. And uh, yeah, it's just fully started over in life. It's been, I don't know, feels great. Once in a while, yeah, I get nervous about it, but it's, you know, I take a few deep breaths and it's, yeah, I'm pretty, I feel very fortunate to be where I am today, for sure. Is there another part of your question? Or no? Okay, cool. Yes, sir. You can just yell. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Uh, was I was that surprised when the answer when it came out about, basically went on Oprah. Um, you know, yes and no. It's like I mean, the, it was the, t the time was coming, and you know, all the signs were pointing to it. You know, eventually, you know, his lawyers still were, as far as at least what I heard, were telling him still not don't don't speak about anything. Um, but that's you know, sometimes lawyers will tell you that. Um, but sometimes no, I mean, I went through the same similar things. Uh, but you know, at least I you know you got to tip your hat to him for. For doing it, I mean, that must have been extremely hard for him. And obviously, he had some. He could only say so much, and I think you could read that in an interview. And was, you know, I, from what I heard, he had seven lawyers just outside that, the door. No, really. And uh, but you know, good for him for starting that process. You know, it's a long process. And I'm still processing it all. And I think someday we'll hear more of the truth from him. Ideally, the sooner the better for the sport of cycling, for all sport. Um, but at, at each, to, each to their own. So, good, great question. Yes? Um, do you think that cycling will recover for sure? It's been around for a long time. A long time. There's a ton of history in cycling. Um, it will recover. It might, you know, it's already started to recover, uh, for sure. Um, will there be, in the, the second part of your question was, will there be all this be doping, doping and cycling? You know, um, I think there's a lot more respect for, for the people who are riding clean than ever. Um, and that's a good sign. Um, I like to remind people that uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency and the, the United States Anti-Doping Agency didn't even exist in the year 2000. And then they didn't even get really rolling until 2004. So, you know, that's just over a decade. That's like, you know, they've been in full swing for a decade. So, you know, what's it gonna look like in 10 years from now? I think it's gonna be a lot, lot better. So I think we have a lot to look forward to. I mean, there's all, you know, we kind of all focus on the negative, and sure, there's been some big negatives, but we also need to focus on the positives. 
you know, they're, they're catching a lot of the cheats. They have, now they have full, they add a competition testing program, which is really the best way to catch the cheaters. And that's in full swing. You know, for a long time, it was, they were trying to get it up to speed, but it didn't work so well. And we knew how to do that, too. So, um, great question. Yes, sir. You should be able to have that time to figure it out over our sports where doping is not less of a problem. Um, I mean, other sports have a problem, too. And cycling has gone through this. I, I don't know. Um, singled out, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but you know, I think it's a help. Uh, in my opinion, it's been a healthy reset for the sport, and this needed to happen. And I always, to be honest with you, like I always thought deep down, like, this whole this whole lie is too big to to not come out. And my uh, my biggest fear was to come for it to just explode. It did. And um, hopefully, the other sports are learning from what cycling has, has gone through. Hopefully, that that has helped them crack down. And I think one day we'll, every every sport will have to operate underneath the, the water code. You know, a lot of the big sports here in the U.S. You know, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, they don't operate under the water code. So I think once we have all sports underneath that, where there's out of competition testing, where you don't know ahead of time if they're coming, I think uh, we'll be able to believe in a lot more sport. <laughs> and last thing, um, in terms of other sports, yeah, I mean, other sports are doing it. The doctor that I worked with in Spain is the, kind of the madman, Ignacio Fuentes. He, um, he told me openly, he tried not to talk about his clients, but sometimes he couldn't help himself. And uh, he worked with professional tennis players, track and field athletes. He told me once that he was, he was responsible for Spain winning the World Cup in soccer. So, I don't know. But for some reason, I believe. So. Um, any, yes. Yeah. Oh, great question. Thanks. <laughs> that was a, that's a hard one. Um, yeah. So for, um, I let's see how, how how did it go. I first testified in front of the grand jury. That was my first process. Once I got out, out of that courtroom. I told the truth for seven hours, and I just I realized that during that time, I was like, wow. You know, I knew there's a good chance that uh, every, everything that I said to the grand jury was sealed. All that information was sealed. Who knew if someday the case would open up or not? You know? So right away, right when I got out of the courtroom, I knew I had to like, tell the truth to, to whoever would listen. Um, and I, I, that's when I decided to do a six, 60 in, minutes interview. And, uh, I waited to the last minute to tell my family. So right, I think it was a day or a couple days before the interview came out, um, I told my family, yeah. Awful, awful. Um, yeah. So what is the target investigation going on? Uh, there was a federal investigation going on and I was probably one of the key witnesses. A lot at stake, a ton at stake, so. I had baseball bats in my, in my doorway. I thought about buying a gun. It was kind of crazy. Yeah, kind of scary. Yes? Um, you know, I don't really think about that anymore. I don't, yeah, I don't look at, I mean, no, I'm not really, you know. Um, I'm proud of, I'm proud of what I've done now. I'm proud of, I'm not proud of what I did, but I'm proud of talking about it. And, you know, like in the book, I, not proud of what's in the book, but I'm proud of writing it. Coming to terms with it and realizing, yeah, the difference between right and wrong. You know, sometimes when you're caught up in something, you don't, you know, my life was going 100 miles an hour for a long time. You know, I get these sometimes, you know, um, sometimes my true self would wake me up in the middle of the night and I had these committee meetings. No, I really, many times. And I, you know, I did worry more about getting caught than I did about winning. Uh, and that says something right away. Finally, like, finally, I think I, due to the help of the FBI, I, I did what I, I finally told the truth. And I feel very fortunate that all this has happened. I feel, I feel very lucky to be here. Yes? 
Oh, the Dolomites, the Italian Dolomites, absolutely spectacular, for sure. But Colorado's not so bad. It's been a lot of time. Colorado's done a lot for me. Yes? Um, even though I was still, you know, um, winning in Liege, best on Liege was pretty, pretty crazy, pretty cool. You know, yeah. Like, I'm proud. I'm proud of winning like the national championship in college because I was so green and had no business even being there. Um, but just that, just being in the action in Liege, best on Liege. I had a coach one time say I'll, I'll never, that I wouldn't finish the race. Um, I did. I think I did it every year from 1997 through. Um, it's just such a hard race. Basically, it's 265 kilometers, and it's like shark's teeth, up and down, up and down, up and down, just relentless. And typically, the weather's cold and rainy, you know, and the thicker the Belgian are. And that was cool, and I won kind of, I wasn't, wasn't a favorite, and I somehow managed to stay with the leaders, and then I kind of surprised them, just put my head down and buried it to the finish line. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I can't really speak about today. I don't really know exactly what they do today. I just know it's all more frequent and they have their system today. It's a lot better. Um, back, back in like 2004, we would have to send in faxes to them. It just seemed very, um, I don't know, it just didn't seem like it worked very well. And you, you were able to, man, you could, you could kind of fudge Sometimes when you were trying to train, like prepare for a big race like the tour, you could kind of mess with your whereabouts and give kind of vague references to where you're going to be training. And, um, and they probably had so much information coming and they didn't know how to figure it out. And I think by the time they figured it out, it was already too late. So, but I, I mean, what I, I just I spoke at a WADA, so, uh, World anti doping uh, their annual conference a couple weeks ago. And um, yeah, and they're heading in the right direction. They have a lot to be proud of. Them. Good question. Yes, sir. Um, you very, uh, very yeah. Oh, tons. spoken to everybody, but I've spoken to, let's see, um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, there hasn't been a whole lot of dialogue, and, you know, it's still pretty fresh, you know, and for a lot of these guys, they just, you know, I've been kind of dealing with, although I lied about, but, you know, dealing with having a positive test since 2004, and so I've had some time to process it all. For a lot of these guys, they were, they, they got pulled in and told the truth in front of the grand jury, or, um, and that's pretty recent for them. I think they're still coming, coming to terms with it. That's the best way I can. Uh, but I don't know, maybe you could ask them. There's some other question down here? Oh, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. Yep. I broke my collarbone a couple of times. A couple of times. Once in. Uh, one time I raced the Tour of, uh, the 2003 Tour de France, the, most of the, yeah, I broke on stage one, unfortunately. Yeah, I finished, yeah. I have all my teeth are fake. <laughs> I ground my teeth down, so, yeah. Not the best decision I ever made. For sure, for sure. Recovering, I don't know, a lot of cancer patients take PPO to recover because their um, uh, the chemo treatments just smash their hematocrit down to, down to nothing, so they have to take it. 
Yeah, I mean, um, obviously in the right circumstance, I'm all for it, but uh, you know, obviously if they're taking it, they better go a while without competing, you know, if they're, if they're you know, gonna come back to bike racing or to some sport. Um, yeah, if it's done properly and ethically, yeah. But, no. you know. Initially, the team paid for everything in the early years, and then all of a sudden, after I was talking about that Festina affair, the Festina drug bust, that's when it all went like underground. But in 1997 and up to the tour in, in 2008, oh, sorry, 1998, or for half of the 98 season, they were handing out white lunch bags after it didn't matter what country you were in. They, were, they had had with him in the team cars and the team and the team trucks and vans. Buses. So it was wild western days. And then once the big, when the police raided this vehicle, the French team, that's when it went fully underground. You know, and, you know, that's when we got secret cell phones and code names and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, sometimes, you know, I think some people ask for more money because of it. Yeah. But, yeah. Pretty sad. Yes, sir. Um, after you hurt yourself cross training for skiing, yeah, did you expect to get a cycling, or did you no. quit to set this? I was just, uh, I was really thrust after I got, I, so I broke my two vertebrae in my upper back. Uh, that was in October. I think it, I was in bed for around three or four months, and then when I got out of bed, they said I could ride a road bike. Little did I know Boulder. I was in Boulder, go to school or ski and then go to school, <laughs> and. Uh, Little did I know Boulder was like the cycling, this huge cycling capital of the world, the US or the world. Um, I started, I'd just go out and ride. I was really frustrated that I couldn't ski that winter. Uh, I've been racing ever since I was like eight years old. That ain't no good. And, uh, and yeah, and then all of a sudden I'm you know, bumping into pros and top amateurs. And then you end up riding with these guys. And I quickly learned that I was pretty good. I don't know, I just, I couldn't drop them. And I, I don't know, I kind of felt good. So, I quickly learned that, yeah, I probably was a better cyclist than I was a skier. Or I had a more, maybe more potential as a cyclist than a skier. So that was pretty cool, and I love, I don't know, I've always been a huge fan of the underdog, sort of the bad news bears. And, I don't know, I love surprising people. It was fun for a while. It was fun. It was, the first few years were really fun. Just a steep learning curve. So I was surprising myself and surprising others. Good question. Yes, sir. I'll get to the next one. Did you have to use uh, any other supplements like nitric oxide or oxide boosters and various boosters or anything of that nature? No. 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 Uh, other things that I did, was, like I said, cortisone. Uh, but you get a T-Rhea, you get the doctor would write a prescription for you, so. Um, but for some reason, you can probably show that's not you. Yeah. Um, I tried, a uh, doctor told me he wants to take insulin, I tried it once, never again. Yeah. Um, I tried growth, growth hormone a few times, or for like a small little block, it made me go ride backwards. So, from what I heard from the doctors, it either, an athlete responds to it and they don't. So I guess I was one of the non-responders. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, testosterone. Yeah, testosterone started with the pills. Then we do patches, a little bit of testosterone patches. Then you could to just do a little bit. You could just leave the patch on for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Make sure you peel it off. You don't want to fall asleep. With it. So these are the things you learn. Um, Let's see, if I think of something else, I'll tell you. But the biggest things were the, the oxygen vectors, uh, EPO or in, in uh, blood, by far the biggest, the biggest game changers. All the other stuff was, those were massive, massive. Yeah. Yeah. It was a 
still an investigation that was still pending, so it that seems everything. That snatch or rat. I've been called that. I've been yeah. I've been called a lot of things. But um, yeah, I was most I mean, nobody told me I was gonna be one of the key witnesses, but the thing was I think it was pretty clear at that point. And then once I started, you know, once I started realizing that I was getting followed, then it was like, okay, I'm I'm one of the key witnesses here. This is crazy. So if it's important, it's just being truthful and honest. And obviously that's what I'm here doing. Can make wrong decisions, and you can also right the ship just because you know it's never too late to tell the truth. I thought I was a decade past telling the truth, you know, and I've been lying for so long. And then finally, I was literally, literally forced to tell the truth, you know, and yeah, my whole life changed like that just by telling the truth, you know, not by not because other people like me were happy, but just my inside myself. It was like a hundred pound backpack came off my off my back, just in that courtroom. So I like I've, since that day in that in what, that Los Angeles courtroom, it's yeah, been a whole new person. And anyway, it says something about the truth. So great question. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, you felt pretty good on this road, so it brought you. What's that? Yeah, no, no, it, it was. Um, the feeling was sort of addicting. It, EPO, for example, like, I mean, number one, with the cyclists are always uh, tired because you're training your butts out. Um, uh, we were always hungry, or um, at least I was, because I was always like on a diet trying to get to my Tour de France weight. Um, and due to that reason, due to being tired and hungry, I mean, that equals hungry. So, always. So, you know, my ex-wife didn't like it so much, that's for sure. With EPO, like, you, it would bring up your self sense of well-being. You would, would recover from these hard workouts quicker. Um, yeah, you'd wake up in the morning, you know, you wouldn't be, like, walking sideways. And be, they, you know, felt like just waterlogged legs from all that hard training. You wake up with a little pep in your step, and uh, you know, that in itself made a big difference. And then on the bike, it was pretty, pretty obvious, pretty clear. And, you know, it wasn't after one injection. It was a slow process, you know. In 1997, my doping was like a little bit of mud on my shoes, and, you know. But in 2002, 2003, that was my next. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was a tough time. Tough time. I. Um, what was it? Um, yeah, I was super sad. I was frustrated. I was. I wanted to come back to the sport, and I was sad I couldn't do the sport that I loved. But I made a huge mistake. I mean, I should have just come forward with the truth, not a, a little bit of the truth, the whole truth, everything, just told the truth, and, and suffered the consequences. I was scared. I didn't even, like, consider the truth, because I knew, had I told the truth, like, all gone, like, all that, you know, never coming back to the sport, black belt for sure, forever. And then the wrath, you know, all my team, I would have to, it would have been bad, but maybe, maybe this all would come out a lot. I, I do beat myself up about it sometimes because you know, in the middle of when I wake up in the middle of the night, because maybe all this would have come out back in two thousand four, and maybe you know, ten years down the road now because of it. You know, easier said than done, I guess. Good question. Yes. My train regimen. Um, yeah, it was pretty pretty serious. It was all about, all about, I mean, basically everything in my life, uh, everything outside of cycling took a, took a back seat. It was super focused, super dedicated. Um, yeah, training five to seven hours a day, most of the time. Uh, yeah, on the bike, yeah. Uh, we didn't do a whole lot of cross training. 
not as much as um, I wish I had, maybe. Um, I wish I did yoga when I was a cyclist. <laughs> I'm learning how to do yoga now, and it's a while. I'm realizing that cycling is like this. And, you, know, you know, doing all these stretches the opposite way makes it flat. Like, anyways. Um, yeah, it was very straight. The diet was crazy. Uh, I was about 35 pounds lighter than, at, or at my peak, at my, um, at my tour de France race weight. So, about 130 pounds. I'd eat. And we're kind of stoppy that way. Like, you naturally get muscle. So, yeah, I had, but it was by, like, I was borderline, probably eating disorder. <laughs> you know, borderline. So, a lot of, a lot of fruit and vegetables. Too much. Why don't we just have a couple more questions? Awesome. I'll get to you in one second. Yes, sir. Thick skin, thick skin. No, you know, early on, like when I first had the positive test in 2004, up to up to that point, I'd been, you know, in my opinion, I was almost the media was almost too nice to me. Um, you know, the if the, I mean they were always shooting to talk to Lance, and when Lance wouldn't talk to them, they talked to me. So I got a lot of attention, and um, but then it quick it quickly turned and soon yeah, and it was it got ugly. There was a lot of Cat calling and all that, uh, but you know, a lot of it was deserved. It. Deserved, I guess. Um, yeah, the media is a whole different. The media can be a monster, and it's yeah, you just deal with it. And at the end of the day, the most important people are your family and your close friends, and that's it. You got to try to put the rest behind. You know, I, tr I honestly I don't even read a whole lot of media, even the good stuff. I just Sometimes I'll ask somebody to read it for me and tell me how it was. <laughs> I don't know. I don't like really looking at myself or reading about myself a lot. But, um, but it's, yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. And it's not easy. And it was almost harder for my family, the close people around me, because like, they're the ones reading the stuff. And, you know, they take it. It's hard to see your, a friend, your friend or a family member being attacked. Um, back to your question, I don't know, I'm just proud of being, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, you know, probably still making plenty more in the future, but I feel like I always get, get to the, eventually get to the right thing, 
and do the right thing. You know, I think deep down I am a good guy. Certainly made plenty of mistakes, but um, yeah, I don't know. Yes, sir. I think that okay. Okay. Yeah. It was a freestanding cabin. It had two floors. It had a uh, jacuzzi. No, <laughs> top, top, top. Where's Tyler Hamilton going from here? Where's Tyler Hamilton going from here? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I kind of like that. I'm, I'm trying to live more in the present now. Just not, not focusing too far down the road. Um, I've been doing a little bit of this stuff, talking, public speaking, I guess. Uh, it's not really what I thought I'd be doing, but it's, uh, I feel like people can get a little, get something out of it, so I like that. Um, I still love sport. I have a couple small coaching companies, me and, me and one guy, Jim Capra, who run it, and um, that's a lot of fun. It's, in a way, it's like teaching, you know, giving back the, the good things that I've learned. Um, but I don't know, I feel like there's something else that I'm going to do it, or want to do, but I don't quite know yet. It's kind of fun not to and I, I, don't, I try not to stress out about it, but um, there's something else. So, yeah, I'll let you know that. <laughs> okay, in the immediate future, we're going to have a 